Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar with Ocean Networks Canada. My name is Luisa Sarmiento. I'm coming to you from Colombia, and I will be a moderator today. We also have Dwight Owens coming from Victoria, Canada, to help with our interactivity and to monitor the chat. Finally, we have Dr. Richard Dewey, which will be our speaker today, also coming from Victoria, Canada. So uh, it is my great pleasure to have this last event for the summer webinar series. The aim of this series was to offer free online interactive events featuring ocean related topics. So this series introduces both scientific and indigenous approaches to understand ocean changes and their importance nowadays. Today's event will mark the end of this series but we will continue this after the summer with the fall webinar series. So as you can see on the screen, uh, these were all the different uh, webinars that we had during the summer from June 10 to today. As you can also see on the screen, you can watch all of the replays on our YouTube channel, Ocean Networks Canada. So make sure that you subscribe and you go check out the other webinars that happened. Today is an interactive event. As you, can, uh, as you have seen from our welcome message, we will let you participate uh, with us using Mentimeter. This is really easy. You can simply uh, go to www.menti.com on a different browser tab, on your cell phone, or uh, if you want, you can download the application. Um, if none of that is possible to you, don't worry. You can simply um, put your comments or answers in the Zoom chat. And to participate, you simply have to use the code 386013. Yes, so we're going to go to mentimeter.com now, and we're going to go ahead and start answering the first question. As always, many of you have already answered that question. We have people from Canada, from the US, from Nova Scotia, from Alexandria, from Rimouski, nice, uh, from Boston, from Belgium, uh, from the Netherlands, that's impressive, from Massachusetts, from Alaska, from Ottawa, from Germany. So I think we have people from all around the world. That is amazing. Uh, it's so great to have so many of you, and I can see that 25 of you already uh, entered your location, so it's really great. It is a really great pleasure to have such a diverse crowd and to have so many participants. So uh, I think we can go ahead and uh, introduce our speaker now. So um, our speaker today is Dr. Richard Dewey. I'm really happy to introduce him. You can see him now on the screen. So uh, Richard Dewey is an impressive person. He is the longest standing employee at Ocean Networks Canada since 1995. He is the founding co-author of the original Venus Cable Observatory proposal in 2001. He also pioneered Neptune. And currently he is the head of the science department leading a team of staff scientists that manage hundreds of research projects. It is my great pleasure and honor, Richard, to give the floor to you. Okay, so uh, thank you everyone for taking the time uh, to, to join us today. And um, this is a presentation that has really come together, obviously only in the last few months. And it's a bit of a response to uh, the uh, shutdown associated with the economic shutdown associated with COVID-19 and uh, stimulated also by some researchers that uh, accessed Ocean Networks Canada data very early on and uh, uh, told us that they were looking at the reduction of shipping noise uh, from our hydrophones uh, as a result of the economic shutdown and shipping shutdown. And we were very interested in this. And uh, so I'm gonna present a, a sort of a broad background presentation today covering this topic. So first, we'd like to thank our host nations, and we acknowledge and respect the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanish peoples on whose traditional territories the university stands and whose historical relationships to the land continue to this day. So a little bit of background for myself. I was actually born in Medicine Hat, Alberta, which is a landlocked province of Canada um, next to British Columbia. And uh, when I was about four, uh, my parents decided to move to Victoria 
And in Victoria, we're, we're on Vancouver Island. We're surrounded by uh, the Pacific Ocean and we have the Gulf Islands and the San Juan Islands nearby. And I grew up cruising on the oceans and learning how to sail and appreciating the importance of the ocean in my life. And uh, as it was sort of associated with the fact that I really enjoyed this living on the ocean and appreciating the ocean that allowed me to think about what I wanted to do as a career. And when I was at university, I decided to go into oceanography. And so I continued on the ocean. Uh, and here I am on a, a vessel west of Vancouver Island, making some measurements in the ocean. And uh, that has led to a career in ocean observing. And when I was at the University of Victoria, a group of us decided to build one of the fir world's first ocean observing networks. And here we are in the Strait of Georgia deploying some of the early Venus uh, installations uh, on the Venus network. And so uh, my life uh, experience has been really, uh, you can see in these three images, there's the horizon of the ocean in all three of them. So the ocean has played a major part in my life and uh, it continues to this day. So the topic for today is really very well captured in this image. Uh, this is uh, downloaded from the Beam Reach organization, uh, which is on San Juan Island. Uh, this picture is actually looking northward in Harrow Strait. Uh, the uh, horizon there is Salt Spring Island. And what we see in this image clearly is a deep sea transit vessel, uh, a ship uh, transiting in this case southward in Harrow Strait. And in the foreground, we have uh, southern resident killer whale orcas. And so what I'm going to be talking today is about sound in the ocean, and in particular sound generated by ships, and perhaps the impact, uh, the most important impact that we are aware of and that we're concerned about is how this, this noise may be impacting southern resident killer whales. So to start off, I think we go to the first Menti question here. So back to you, Louisa. Thank you, Richard. And yeah, to get you all prompt into this talk, we want to know if you know, does sound propagate differently in the air than in the ocean? So for that, it's fairly simple. As we explained it in the beginning, perfect. Uh, you can go ahead and enter the Mentimeter code 386130. And wow, okay, many of you have already answered, so that's great. I see we have a very diverse uh, answer. <laughs> so 17 to 1, most of you are saying sound travels faster and more efficiently in water. So I can see we have a big, big difference. I think, Richard, so I'll turn it to you. Yes, thank you. So this, this is, um, you're all very uh, knowledgeable, therefore, sound does travel both faster and more efficiently in the ocean. And uh, so I'll go back to sharing my screen. And uh, it travels uh, approximately five times faster and maybe about five times um, uh, more efficiently in the ocean as well, which means that uh, uh, sound can travel much further in the ocean than it can in the atmosphere. So a, a vessel, for example, might be heard even before we can see it over the horizon. In the ocean, this is not uh, atypical. This is very common that we, in fact, might be able to hear a ship long before we can see it come over the horizon. And that's partly because the sound travels much faster, but also much more efficiently. So that's something to be aware of. So the, this is a little bit of a summary of the presentation today. And the gist of the issue is that the economic slowdown associated with COVID-19 has resulted in less vessel traffic on the ocean. Um, this is, spans across all uh, transit sectors, like container ships, freighters, oil tankers, ferries, cruise ships continue to be uh, restricted. Um, and the reduced traffic has resulted in less sh shipping noise in the ocean. So I'm going to present why and how we monitor sound in the ocean, why it might be important. Uh, I'll then highlight some of the critical aspects of shipping noise in particular. And this is a form of pollution, if you like. It's a noise pollution in the ocean. And then I will show you some of the evidence that we have that were reductions in shipping and reductions in noise early in 2022 um, associated with really the economic uh, turndown due to COVID. 
And really the takeaway if, um, is, is very broad, but the economic slowdown has generally had a positive impact on many natural environments in the world. I think in the atmosphere with, with contrails in the, in the atmosphere, pollution, industrial pollution, and noise pollution in the ocean. So generally, uh, the economic turndown has in fact had a very positive uh, response in the environment. So sound in the ocean, we've, al uh, we've already identified the fact that it travels faster and more efficiently. And humans and land animals rely very much on sight, uh, sight, sorry, sight as well as sound and smell to navigate our environment. Uh, if you close your eyes, you're immediately sort of um, restricted in, in your ability to move, understand what's in, in your environment. Uh, and you would have to reach out with your hands, perhaps try to smell if something was in the room. But in the ocean, light attenuates very, very quickly. And it's very dark within even, co certainly in coastal environments, within meters. So most marine life has developed a very acute audio and pressure sensing capabilities. So here we have a seal. Uh, we can see the ears there uh, protruding from the side of its head. And all marine mammals have very acute hearing and vocalization capabilities. So they use sound very, very much in the ocean because light does not penetrate. So back to you, we'll ask the next Menti question. What might generate sound in the ocean? So once again, uh, you can simply go to menti.com and use the code 38613. I see that a few of you have already answered, so that's great. You can choose between wind, waves, bubbles, ships, or animals. Let's see. Okay. And, I, and I think you can, you can select all that might be generating sound. And this is obviously uh, not intended to be a trick question. All of these sources, as you are identifying, do create sound in the ocean. Um, at different frequencies, we'll see, and at different levels of intensity. So this is good. You will realize that there are a lot of sources that generate sound in the ocean, from wind and waves and bubbles and ships as well. So thank you for that. So as we've just identified, there are a lot of sources for sound in the ocean. And one of the ways we look at sound in the ocean is we look at the frequency content of the sound in the ocean. And this graphic here shows us that some of the man-made sources for sound, uh, seismic surveys, pile driving, explosions, these are really construction sounds. You can think of this as a construction site where we're building a marina, for example. Um, fishing activity where we're using sonars to um, identify uh, sound. And then shipping noise from the engines covers a wide range here. And what we're plotting up the sound is on the frequency range. So we're going from low frequencies to high frequencies. And down at the bottom part, we see where some of the marine mammals or animals may be listening in this spectrum. And so low frequencies are the lowest sound. So if I speak lowly, I'm talking deep down, that's low sounds here. And high frequencies would be up at the higher register. So a whistle would be up in this range here. So I just put on here where humans typically have an ability to hear. We might be able to hear sounds from maybe 50 hertz up to maybe 12 or 15 kilohertz. I suspect my hearing uh, is, is trailing off at 10 kilohertz or so. And when I'm speaking, I'm probably speaking in this sort of kilohertz range, one to two kilohertz range. Below this frequency, we really have a difficulty in hearing it. It's very low fre frequencies. And we would actually start to feel these sounds. So the lowest sounds here are actually starting to become vibrations that we might feel. And the ultrasound we can't hear as well. Uh, they're very, very high frequencies that we can't hear. But we notice for toothed whales and orca whales, they're very similar range to humans. So sort of 100 hertz up to maybe even 100 kilohertz, 100,000 hertz. And uh, so they cover a much broader range than we do, but very similar to ourselves. Baleen whales, these are the largest whales in the ocean, blue whales, humpback whales, gray whales. They have a lower frequency register and they in fact transmit sounds deep down in these low registers. And some of the whales, blue whales as an example, uh, communicate perhaps over great distances with a huge amount of energy in these low frequencies. So there is expectation or there's a, a belief that these whales communicate over tens of kilometers, maybe even hundreds of kilometers with these low frequencies. 
So I'm going to be talking throughout this talk about some frequency content of sound, and that's the low frequencies or deep sound and high frequencies like whistles. And I'll have some examples to come back to later where this will be a little bit clearer. So this plot here um, is from some early work done by a researcher, uh, Wenz, and it's a study he published in 1962 where he started to put out the range of sounds we hear in the ocean and characterize them on a spectrum. And so this plot is showing us again at the, the x-axis along here, low frequencies to high frequencies. And the vertical axis here is sound intensity. Now this is measured in decibels and that is a logarithmic scale. So a decibel increase from 80 to 100 is a factor of 20. It's not just a little bit of an increase, it's a, an order, it's a, a factor of 20 or two orders of magnitude difference between 80 decibels and 100 decibels. So that's just something to keep in, in mind. We, we measure sound, uh, the changes are so dramatic that in fact, we measure them on a logarithmic scale. And what this plot is showing us is that there are a range of typical sounds in the ocean. And I'll talk about three types of sources. And there is a, basically a lower range where the sound is almost never below a certain level. Everywhere you go in the ocean, you will hear sound at low frequencies and high frequencies. And at, the, at times it's very loud. So this, is the ma this black curve here is sort of the maximum typical range you might find of audio intensity in the ocean. At the lowest frequencies, we have things like earthquakes and uh, explosions. So this blue curve here is actually perhaps an explosion. Uh, detonation of dynamite, for example, would send off a very short uh, impulse, but it would be very, very loud near the sound. Now, fortunately, there's a, not a lot of explosions in the ocean, but when they do occur, they're extremely loud. Earthquakes are also very low frequency and have a tremendous amount of energy. And we can hear earthquakes thousands of kilometers away in the ocean. In the middle band here, we have basically these curves here identifying ship noise. So we have deep sea vessels. If we were to go anywhere in the ocean and put a hydrophone in the water, we would actually pick up engine noise that perhaps peaks at around 100 hertz. So low frequencies up to about 1,000 kilohertz. And this red curve is showing what it might sound like the intensity if we were right underneath one of those deep sea vessels. It's right at the maximum range of what we would hear in this medium range. At the higher frequencies, we have some of the natural uh, events that are generating sound in the ocean. And perhaps most noticeably, we see an increase with increased wind speed. So this sea state or the Beaufort sea scale, if you like, as the wind increases, the intensity of sound increases from wind, waves, bubbles, uh, waves breaking. And even in this green curve, if we, have, if we were underneath a thunderstorm, for example, and the rain was beating down on the top of the ocean. So this, this range from 100 to 10 kilohertz is the audible range that we would be listening in. So what this shows is that we've got low frequency, middle frequency, and high frequency sources in the ocean. And we can measure generally they're at the lowest, uh, quietest levels and the loudest levels. And just as a final comment here, generally we're seeing the shipping noise increase a few decibels every decade. So this has been increasing with the number of ships that has been increasing in the world. So that gives us uh, some idea of how we look at sound. Uh, the reason we would be perhaps most interested in our local waters, and this is around Vancouver Island, is because we have an iconic species that is very important uh, for our, our, in some sense, it characterizes a lot about our area. We have a coastal environment, it's, it's a healthy ocean, um, and it supports a vibrant uh, marine ecosystem that includes herring, salmon, and this top predator, the orca whale. And for the southern resident killer whales, this is a group um, of whales, a community that uh, eats mostly salmon. And they use acoustics for a number of reasons. Uh, we, we know that they're threatened because of their food source. If there aren't enough, isn't enough food for them, their health is compromised. There is a history that they have had contaminants and these are both natural and human toxins. Uh, human pollution has been on the decline, but some toxins are persisting. And then we have noise as a form of risk 
to their uh, survival. And the use of sound, they use sound to, to communicate socially. They are a very social uh, animal. They, in fact, talk to each other, uh, perhaps communicating where they're going. They teach each other what uh, the, the, the parents teach their young, how to stay with the group. They, in fact, develop dialects and, in, in fact, entire sort of um, uh, vocabularies that are local to their pod and to their clan. Uh, they also use sound to echolocate to find salmon like bats. So bats use echolocation to find insects. Uh, southern resident killer whales use echolocation to identify salmon. Remember, you can't see more than a few meters. And so if you're trying to track down a salmon that is 100 meters away, these whales use echolocation to target the salmon, find the salmon in their environment, and then swim and chase it down and eat it. So with echolocation, uh, they need to have a very quiet environment to find their salmon. And then their environmental awareness. They need to know where they are. Are they near sh shallow rocks uh, approaching a strait? Are they near waves? Is it windy? So forth. So they use sound for a variety of reasons. And is, as the same as we show, when ships are coming along, they would be painfully aware that this ship is present. It's very likely they're, they're doing some um, uh, uh, spy hopping here. And it's very likely they've come up to see perhaps what this sound is that they're hearing. And they're seeing that sure enough, it's a vessel uh, even several kilometers away. So they use sound very intensely. And this is a major concern when we have ships in the area. So the Department of Fisheries and Oceans released a report in 2017 that identified that the southern resident killer whale population is endangered according to the Species at Risk Act of Canada. So the, the population is, de, uh, is, is endangered in the sense that there are only about 73 left in this population uh, in the Southern resident po um, community. Um, and they are struggling to uh, reproduce and that population is not growing. So they are an endangered species. Uh, life functions are interfered with by ship noise. So there's a recognition that ship noise is uh, compromising their health. And perhaps most critically, vessel noise in critical habitat was identified as perhaps the most important issue. Critical habitat would be identified as regions in the Salish Sea or around Vancouver Island that the whales frequently forage in. They find it as critical for finding salmon. This is where they want to socialize. This is areas where they frequent, uh, they're, they're found frequently. And so ship noise in those areas is, is perhaps most important. Uh, there's a range of mitigations that we might uh, em employ to reduce that noise. Um, one of them is to reduce the source levels. So we might imagine quieter ships are better than noisy ships. And the Port of Vancouver is actually working to encourage ships to have a, a, a less uh, noisy signature than loud, loud ships. And this could be something like a, an engine that is not very efficient, or it has a propeller that has a crack um, or a crankshaft that is squeaky. So the Port Authority is working to reduce the noise from ships. The other way we might mitigate it is to change how ships operate. We can actually say no ships in an area, and that would clearly reduce the amount of, of, of sound. But as we'll see later, uh, shipping is a critically important economic driver in this region, and it's unlikely we're going to remove shipping, but perhaps we can uh, mitigate it through asking ships to slow down. That would reduce the sound. We may re relocate traffic lanes away from critical habitat. That would certainly help the southern resident killer whales. We're considering uh, ideas like putting the ships through in convoys so that uh, when there are two or three ships together, yes, it's loud, but at least they're loud together. And then there could be a quiet period rather than spacing them out and having loud noise all the time. So this is this idea of maybe even having quieter periods. So we, we designate in certain times during the day when, when it's quiet and that would give the whales reprieve from the noise. So these are some of the strategies that are uh, being considered, but they're very difficult to implement. However, what we're doing right now is really an experiment, an involuntary experiment. So with the economic slowdown associated with COVID-19, we were seeing a reduction in uh, transportation and commerce on the ocean. And these were resulting in a reduction in the amount of shipping noise in the ocean. 
So in some sense, we were doing an involuntary experiment that is reducing the ship noise and reducing the amount of uh, sa sound, anthropogenic sound in the ocean. It turns out there is actually an organization already prepared for this sort of opportunity called the International Quiet Ocean Experiment. It's a group that Ocean Networks Canada has been affiliated with for over a decade. And this group is of researchers and uh, data providers is actually seeking out opportunities where we may see a reduction or a change in the amount of anthropogenic noise in the ocean. And they are painfully aware, this group is aware and doing a lot of research at the moment to quantify the reduction of shipping noise throughout the globe as a result of the COVID shutdown. So this is an active community of researchers taking advantage of this involuntary experiment that we are actually conducting by having the COVID shutdown. So I'm gonna ask this and I've given some hints already. What instrument do we use to measure sound underwater? So for those that have arrived uh, just a little bit before, please just go to menti.com and use the code 386213. And I see that we have a few participants saying that is a hydrophone and a hydroprobe. So uh, you can select any of those answers or all of those answers if you think. I think, I think again, that this shows the, the uh, education value of our audience here. We use hydrophones, which is just a fancy word for an underwater microphone. So in air, and what I'm speaking into right now is a microphone. And when we need to modify a microphone to listen underwater, we need to um, make sure that the water has a very good connection to the sensing element, because the sensing element is trying to pick up tiny pressure variations in the water. And so we, we call that a hydrophone. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, our hydrophone network and the instrumentation we use. So this is a, uh, a map of Western Canada, in fact, the coast of British Columbia. So we can see here uh, on the globe, this is North America here, and this little section here is Western part of, or the Eastern part of the Pacific and the Western part of North America. And all of these symbols, and I'll zoom in a little bit, are hydrophones deployed by Ocean Networks Canada. And we're continuing to increase the number of hydrophones. We have some up in Prince Rupert and Kitimat and along mostly in the Southern part of British Columbia. We have a hydrophone in the Arctic. This is under Cambridge Bay Observatory. And within a year, we will have hydrophones also in, Church, in, in Hudson's Bay here on an observatory being built in Churchill. So we're continuing to update this map of where we have hydrophones deployed. And I'll zoom in a little bit. And this, uh, now the southern port of British Columbia around Vancouver Island. So here's the University of Victoria right at the southern tip in Victoria. We have a, a concentration of hydrophones in the Salish Sea. And then offshore on the Neptune Observatory, we have hydrophones as well. And there has historically been a hydrophone at each of these locations. At any one time, we may have live hydrophones only on a, on a subset, but most of these sites have a hydrophone at one time or another. So I'm going to be talking about some of the data from some of these hydrophones. This is a picture uh, here of a hydrophone. It's a little rubber tip. It uh, needs to have a good connection again between seawater and the sensing element. Oops. Uh, sensing element of the water. It's spe specially designed not to allow the seawater to penetrate to the sensing element, but to have a very good contact with the, with the, with the seawater. And sound is a form of a pressure wave. It's a compression wave. And so these elements are very sensitive to measuring pressure fluctuations. And so sound is a, high, a, a series of high and low pressures that propagate through. And so the sensing element measures high and low voltages associated with those pressure variations. And these voltage variations are then recorded and they can be played back as an audio file. So sometimes we record, a, we deploy a single hydrophone. For example, this would be a single hydrophone. And sometimes we group them together. And in this case, under these uh, four yellow sheaths here, we have four hydrophones being deployed in the Strait of Georgia. And this would allow us to uh, find direction of where the sound is coming from. So we're all familiar, we have two ears in our head. And the reason we have two ears and not one 
is the fact that we can actually determine from two uh, sound sources, or a sound source coming to two ears, we can tell the direction of which the sound is coming from. So when somebody speaks um, uh, on our right, we can hear the sound coming into our right ear first and then our second ear, and we turn and we can face the person to our right. And if somebody is on our left side, that sound comes into our left ear first and then our right ear, and we know they're to our left and we turn to the left. And we can do the same in the ocean. We can have multiple hydrophones and then determine which direction the sound is coming from. So some of our installations not only have one hydrophone, but arrays of hydrophones. We call this a hydrophone array. So I, what I'd like to do now is sort of jump to some of the really the, the core of this, this presentation, which is the fact that we have a noisy environment in the ocean when ships are present. And this is a recording uh, recorded from our uh, Strait of Georgia installation at our node in, in deep water, 300 meters. And this is a recording made in uh, middle of July this year, so only about a month ago. Uh, it's a five minute clip. I won't play all five minutes, but I want you to identify that here's what that recording looks like of the voltages, uh, plus and minus. And I'm going to play it for you in a second. And we see there's a number of interesting features in this five minute recording. There's something happening up front here, then it seems to go quieter, and then it gets noisy again. But it's very difficult by looking at this sort of form of the data to identify what we are listening to. So I'm going to play this audio. And while I do this, I, I want to uh, warn the audience, I'd like you to turn your audio up uh, so that you can hear it, but not so much that it's painful. So. If you have an ability to adjust your speaker volume or your headset volume, uh, be, it, be careful to not make it too loud. I don't want it to be too loud, but you may have to turn it up if it is not very loud. So I'm gonna play it and I will stop and play several times. So I'm gonna start playing and we'll listen to what's in this beginning of this recording. Now it's pretty nondescript, but in some sense we might be able to determine, yes, that sounds like a vessel traveling along. And that's this early part of the recording here. I'm now gonna to jump to a place where that sound, I think it's the same vessel, gets quieter, and there's something in the background. And I want you to listen very carefully. There is an orca whale or some orca whales chirping. And it's very possible they were chirping here, but they couldn't be heard. And when the ship becomes quieter, we can actually start to hear them. It's quite faint. So again, you may want to turn your speakers up. And I'll warn you again, when we go to the end section, I want us to listen to the very loud vessel that, I think it's the same vessel. At the end, uh, we may want again, control our volume so it's not too loud. But I'm going to play this period here when in fact the ship sound diminishes and all of a sudden we can hear buried in the background some orca whales. So um, I think you were able to hear the fact that the ship decreased and there was a call just as it was decreasing, but when it was at its quietest, sure enough, we could hear a faint call of an orca whale. Now, I, we don't know where those whales were relative to this hydrophone. They could well have been um, kilometers away and yet we could still hear them, but we couldn't hear them when the engine noise was loud. And this is really the problem. The orca whales, their range of being able to hear each other and communicate and echolocate is greatly reduced when there's engine noise. Now I'm going to jump to near the end here where um, uh, the engine noise is getting louder and louder and I may play right near the end at four minutes and 30 seconds when it's quite loud. And I encourage you to just adjust your headphones or your volume in case it's too loud. I'm gonna play. And I'm going to jump ahead to when it starts to get quite a bit noisier. So now the ship is getting noisy and I'm trying to talk over top of the ship. And so one strategy I use 
is I speak louder. And if you've got your microphone turned up, I'm turning out to be very loud, and the ship is loud. But if I speak softly, you can't hear what you say. So you can see some of the problems that the orca whale would have in this noisy environment. The more ships there are, uh, the noisier it is. And these ships are very likely not uh, nearby either. They could be a kilometer away from the hydrophone. Some of the recordings we have when they're very close are extremely loud. So there in some sense in this one image is, or this one slide is the gist of the problem. When ships are present, um, it's very difficult for the orca whales to communicate. And by reducing the number of ships, not necessarily the audio, during COVID, we didn't change the ships. We didn't make the ships quieter. What we did do is reduce the number of ships. We reduced the ferry crossings. We eliminated uh, cruise ships altogether. And so the number of ships were reduced and there were many more quieter periods. Uh, this is just to let you know that um, technically our, we need to record uh, very quickly to get the higher audio sounds. Again, we know these orca whales and porpoises can listen up at 50 kilohertz and higher. And so we need to sample very quickly to record those very high frequencies. And our very sensitive hydrophones um, measure in 24 bits. This is the dynamic range. This is an idea. The idea here is that it allows us to separate the quietest sounds from the loudest sounds. Um, and so for one hydrophone, we may record up to 80 gigabytes of data a day. And just to give you a perspective of how much that is, it would typically fill your computer hard drive within less than a week. And that's from one hydrophone element. So it turns out it's not very feasible for us to listen to all this data. We have perhaps 20 hydrophones deployed on the observatory, all recording 24 seven. We would need uh, an army of people, hundreds of people, if we wanted to listen to these, uh, all these recordings. But one thing we can do is look at them uh, in terms of a picture. So I'm going to just show you here one of the tools we use to analyze audio sound is called a spectrogram. And what I'm showing here is the time along the bottom, and I, in this recording, it's 11 seconds long, and frequency on the vertical axis here. So from low frequencies to high frequencies. And here's a kilohertz. I'm speaking again in this sort of range, one to two kilohertz. And I'm going to play this audio clip. And we can see in this audio clip a number of interesting signals. There's clearly something happening with some sort of interesting whistles or calls. And then there's a background sound, which again turns out to be some vessel noise or anthropogenic noise. And I'm going to play this audio clip and you're going to recognize what I think will be familiar to many of you, an orca whale calling. And in fact, by looking at this image, a trained technician or a scientist who's used to looking at these spectrograms will immediately understand that yes, this is the classic signature of a, an orca whale, and perhaps even being able to understand that this is a southern resident orca whale as opposed to a bigs or a transient orca whale. And so I'm going to play this, and as I do, I'm going to follow along. And in fact, I'm going to train your eye to be able to hear how, these, how we can actually interpret a visual interpretation of an audio signal. So there's a background noise of, of ship, and then there's some of these orca calls. So I'll play this a couple of times and I want you to follow along. And so I tried to keep up with the recording there and we heard these calls and there's some background hiss, which is the engine sound. And I'm going to actually teach you a little bit about an orca call at this last little section here. So this call, interesting double part call here has a number of interesting signals. So medium to medium high and then low to high. So it sort of goes. So you can see audio visually low to medium, lower to higher. And I'll play that. And again, you'll be able to follow along and look at the signal as well as listening to it. So in, in the interest of time, I'm going to move on. 
but it's interesting how we can now visualize sound. And this would allow us to look at long sections of audio data, identify signals without having to listen to them. While we're on the topic of southern or of orca whales, this is another recording uh, made with Ocean Networks Canada. And this also has some of the similar characteristics, but it's a different whale. This turns out to be a bigs or a transient whale call. And it's often referred to as a meow sort of sound. And you can sort of see this meow, meow, meow in the trace. This recording is only about, this clip is only about six seconds long. It's quite quick, but we remember you're gonna hear for this meow, meow, meow sort of sound. And I may not be getting quite the tonals right. This, all of these harmonics give it richness, but you'll actually only sort of think you're hearing one sound, but it's a rich sound, so it has lots of harmonics. I'm gonna play this and listen for the meow sound of a, of a big or, transient orca. So the southern residence was sort of a and here's the, the transient, which is a more of a meow. And so right away, you're actually becoming, you're like uh, Helen DeGeneres. You can actually speak whale. You can not only uh, look at a recording and recognize a southern resident versus a transient residence, but you can actually distinguish um, what they're trying, uh, not what they're trying to say, but different communities, the transients from, from the, um, the resonance. These visual representations are very useful for us because they allow us to look at something that is this. Remember this five minute recording? We can't really see what's in there in this sort of present presentation. If we look at the spectrogram, we can see that yes, there's this louder portion, a quieter portion, and then loud again. And if we look very closely at this transition, and I'm going to zoom in there, yes, we have some uh, transition, these ship tonals coming along here with intense sound and the low frequencies. And then we had those faint recordings. So this is only a 10 second recording. I'll play this. This is when that ship sound was decreasing. And then we could hear the orca whales chirping away there in the background. So spectrograms allow us to look at sound and digest a tremendous amount of information at the same time. So another mentee question here, what strategies do you use in a noising environment? So for this, uh, for time purposes, we'll just ask you to reflect on this. And if you want to bring your thoughts into the Zoom chat, go ahead. I already sort of indicated one way we can do it is we can shout, but that's exhausting. It's stressful. Um, shouting in a noisy environment is not something we want to do very much. So uh, what I want to zoom in now is sort of the crux of this whole presentation. I'm sorry it's taken so long, but the reduction of shipping, and I'm going to look at some shipping in the southern part of British Columbia. This is our location. And there was a paper, uh, some researchers at the University of Dalhousie jumped on this opportunity maybe as early as February, at the very beginning of the of our awareness of the COVID economic shutdown. And they managed to publish a paper by May of this year, um, already looking at the real time observations of the impact of COVID-19 on underwater noise. And they looked at observations or hydrophone data from our inshore observatory and our offshore observatory. Um, and I'll show some data from these. I've already shown you some recordings from the inshore, but I really want to focus a bit more on the shipping, which is what changed during COVID. So these two bottom panels here are showing the shipping tracks. And this sh these shipping tracks are retrieved from um, ship information. All major ships have to identify or transmit a signal called the automatic identification signal. And every few seconds, they transmit their position and their speed. And what we can do is if this is a plot for an entire year, I think it's 2017, um, and it shows all the shipping traffic in our local region. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. And what's amazingly clear here is there's some areas that are so heavily trafficked that they become traffic lanes. These are the shipping lanes. This is the uh, inbound shipping lane into Juan de Fuca Strait. They come in on the right-hand side and they leave on the left-hand side. These are the deep sea vessels. They must stay in that shipping lane. 
Smaller vessels travel inside and we see tugs and other vessels traveling inside but also forming shipping lanes. Some are going into Puget Sound into the United States and they come into Port Angeles to pick up a pilot. Some are coming into Vancouver and Victoria and they come into Victoria, pick up a pilot, and then they continue on into Vancouver Harbor. The critical habitat for the orca whales is out throughout this region. And I'm just gonna identify, Juan de Fica Strait is identified as a critical habitat, sorry, Swift Shore Bank, even further out, right underneath the shipping rain here. Harrow Strait is a critical uh, habitat and obviously very active shipping lanes congested right through uh, the northern part of Harrow Strait. Um, around Saturna and these islands, this is also known as critical habitat. And then at the mouth of the Fraser River, here we have ships going right up the river. This is also critical habitat. The salmon return to the river, so the orca whale feed in this area, and it's right near some very busy shipping lanes. This AIS information also allows us to determine what types of ships are going through the area. So they have to, they identify uh, the ship and what type of ship they are. And I just wanna point out that here we see in Juan de Fuca Strait, it's mostly cargo ships. So predominantly there are cargo ships traveling through Juan de Fuca Strait. As we get up to other areas like Active Pass, it's mostly BC ferries that are going through Active Pass. And then as we get into Vancouver Harbor, it's a collection of all types of ships, cargo ships, fishing, tugs, and uh, passenger vessels as well. So we can distinguish what types of vessels are transiting throughout the region from the AIS data. And it is that AIS data that that previous paper used to identify that shipping was being reduced by 30% and sound was down by much, as much as 3 dB. And I'll talk about that now. So the other area we can look at is the Vancouver Port, uh, Fraser Port Authority reports this number of ships coming into their, uh, the harbor and where they're coming from. And interesting enough, China is a very important trading partner uh, with Vancouver and Canada. And in fact, had started to see a reduction of shipping as early as late 2019. And so I'm just gonna put up some of the, the numbers I was able to download from the Vancouver Port Authority. And they're showing for a number of years, 2017, 2018, 2019, both inbound and outbound metric tons of cargo. I'm just gonna zoom in on this, the last couple of years here. It's a bit hard to read. But well, we can see for 2019, China represented almost 33% by tonnage of all inbound and outbound cargo into the port of Vancouver. And it turns out uh, China was already starting to see the effects of the, the COVID uh, industrial shutdown by late 2019 and early 2020. That is what allowed that study to, to take advantage of that very early shipping reduction, mostly out of China. Uh, but the Port Authority, and I just want to plot here, this is containers. These are these uh, truck containers that come into the Port of Vancouver, also showed a dramatic decrease during the COVID shutdown, and it's almost returned to normal now. This uh, increase we're seeing here is the fact that container transportation has been increasing steadily uh, for the last couple of decades. Um, but this here is a reduction due to really associated with COVID. So one last plot here, and then, then we're almost done. This is a record, this is uh, from a hydrophone in the Strait of Georgia, showing that pre-COVID, things were pretty uh, stable. In, uh, and what I'm looking at here is the, the, the quietest times, the median or 50% of the power spectrum and 90% of the, uh, the loudest periods. And what we were seeing by March, we saw a dramatic reduction in all of the sounds from our hydrophone. So just to put this perspective, we're looking at 100, kilo, 100 hertz. So this is right in this shipping band. And the quietest times, this panel here, is associated with when the spectrum is at its quietest, this black curve down here. And it went down by as much as 6 dB, which is a factor of four. So the quietest times in the Strait of Georgia dropped down in March by, four, by 6 dB. The median or the middle part of the spectrum dropped by maybe three dB, so a factor of two, so it also decreased. And the loudest sounds, that's the top part up here, also decreased by perhaps as much as three dB. So the entire noise spectrum in the shipping band was reduced during COVID. But interesting enough, we're seeing some of the median and the loudest starting to come back. And the quietest periods seem to have disappeared altogether. So 
this this quietest period has already rebounded up a little bit uh, by June and July of this year. So let me finish here by saying shipping reductions starting in late 2019 and continuing through July 2020 have resulted in a quieter ocean, perhaps more importantly, quieter periods. The ships themselves aren't quieter, but there's less of them. And this is likely a global phenomenon. We're not uh, unique to this, but we do have an extensive hydrophone array uh, that allow us to quantify that. And I do want to point out that analysis and assessments are ongoing. There are at least four different research groups using our data and data from around the world to assess the impact of the COVID economic shutdown on shipping noise. So the last uh, question we want to ask here is, what strategies do you think the whales can use to avoid noisy environments? And that is a very tricky thing to assess. So you can go ahead, uh, Richard, and comment on those. Okay, this is good. So yes, they can change their depth. Um, that's only going to be limited in the sense that in coastal environments, they may only have a bit uh, a depth range. Leave the area. However, you saw the shipping lanes are pervasive. They're everywhere. And in the Salish Sea, the, you can almost look out and see a vessel at any time, whether it's coming in or coming out of your field of view. So there's almost nowhere to go. So these are strategies that we might use. If, it's, if I'm going to a noisy pub, eventually I go home and I, I get a quieter environment. The whales can't avoid it. So this is really part of the challenge for them is that they can speak louder, they could um, uh, try to avoid the areas, but it's very limited what they can do. So I think that's, uh, that's those are all great answers. I, I agree, it's, it's a really challenging thing. Leave the area, but this is their critical habitat. This is where the salmon are. They don't really leave the area. Do we mean leave the Salish Sea entirely? Uh, you saw from the shipping lanes, there's nowhere that they can get uh, shipping retrieval from in the Salish Sea. They have to go out to the Pacific. Thanks, Louisa. No problem. Let's go ahead and uh, go to the conclusion. Okay, I will share my screen one last time here. This is sort of some, some concluding thoughts. Have sound levels already started to return to normal? We know that most of the shipping activity has come back. There's still a reduced ferry schedule. Uh, some of the cruise ships aren't coming back, but many of the others are returning. Um, will the short-term reprieve they've had, maybe six months or so, make a difference? Are the whales healthier now than they were this time last year? Those assessments are ongoing. And will these long-term, will there be long-term reductions in our commas or perhaps our, our uh, industrial behavior that could affect the whales on a long-term, which might affect their population? If we're thinking about returning, uh, taking them off the endangered species list, their population has to grow, and that's a multi-year problem. They need to be healthy for many years, have healthy young. Those young have to uh, grow up to be healthy. So we're looking at a 10-year period before we can say, yes, they're returning and they're healthy. We need a 10-year reduction of, of, of noise in the ocean. Is that likely to happen? Uh, let, an open question. So thank you very much. Um, Yes, so thank you very much everybody for attending uh, this event. Please stay for the Q&A. We're gonna have that in two minutes. Make sure that you connect with us in our different media. So you use our website, you can use YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Please go ahead and take a screenshot of this, but also feel free to use our uh, Ocean Data Portal. And also remember that the Ocean Networks Canada Fall Series is coming soon to you. So make sure that you subscribe to that. So we also want to thank all the different funders. So Ocean Edwards Canada is funded by the Canada Foundation for Innovation, the Government of Canada, Natural Resources Canada, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, Canary, the Government of British Columbia, the, o the University of Victoria, and many, many others. So thank you, everybody. And now we're going to have our Q&A. So Dwight will share our Mentimeter, and we will have our Q&A there we will do the same thing as we've been doing for the entire presentation. Go to menti.com and use the code 386013. So the first question is, are anal analyses shown in the graphs for COVID-19 lockdown available for other frequencies too? Uh, that's a good question. I, um, 
we are looking at other frequencies. The reason we picked 100 Hertz is because that was the frequency band that the that a paper that was published in May used. So we felt it made a connection. Um, we continued the analysis on through um, June and July. And uh, so that was the choice for 100 Hertz. It is also sort of the peak range for vessel noise. Um, and we are start, yes, we, we are looking at other frequencies, but that one was particularly chosen because of that study and because it is at the peak of the vessel traffic noise. But there are other things to look forget, yes. Were there concurrent measurements of chemical pollutants during the downturn, example, hydrocarbons? That's an excellent question. And in fact, this uh, measuring uh, other contaminants, toxins, hydrocarbons in the ocean is a very challenging task. Um, in most cases, historically, the way we uh, analyze for constituents and, and foreign matter in the ocean is by making physical collection of samples and then analyzing those. And in some sense, uh, the oceanographic community was also hampered by COVID. Um, for a few months there, the Department of Fisheries Ocean was not going out to sea. Um, they they uh, parked their vessels. And so, in fact, we were hampered somewhat by going out and making those types of connect collections. Um, but no, there, unfortunately, there is not a similar uh, research effort to measure. Um, but perhaps in the long run, we might, uh, when we get back to sampling in the ocean, identify that there, what, there was a noticeable reduction, but that's going to be on doing analysis that I'm not aware of, but that's a good question. Can, you, can we use machine learning to identify unique whale populations? Uh, yes, that is an active area of research. I showed those spectrograms and we were able, and a trained eye, a trained ear, I should say, and a trained eye can look at those spectrograms and interpret the calls and distinguish between the species, uh, the populations, for example. Um, and so that we can train computers to look for those shapes, um, just as your eye was able to distinguish between a one call and another by its shape and anticipate what it might sound like. We can train computers to do that. And then we can set the computers onto this massive archive. And we probably have the better part of 500 gigabytes. So better part of a, peta, a half a petabyte of data, which is hydrophone data. And we need to have the computers go in there and identify the content and characterize when we're hearing uh, Southern residents, when we're hearing big transients, and when we're hearing ships, and perhaps, and it's very difficult, when we're hearing both together. So yes, using computers is an active area of research and we will be doing that. Good, good question. So how deep are the, these hydrophones usually placed? And how so, does that affect sound frequencies recorded? Yeah, so that's a, another very good question. In, in most of Ocean Networks Canada's installations, the hydrophones are located near the bottom because that's where we have our cables and our connections. Um, we have very few that are off the bottom by any substantial amount. We do have thoughts and plans to perhaps put in some vertical arrays, which are moorings which would get the hydrophones off the bottom. Um, the consequence of being near the bottom is we get some bottom interference, but in fact, it's not, uh, it's not a critical uh, limitation. We're able to do quite a bit of, of understanding and capture many of the characteristics of ocean sound uh, with hydrophones that are near the bottom and not uh, up in the water column. But that is, there are some benefits to being up in the water column. Good question. Great. Are there similar studies on um, renoise pollution done with respect to terrestrial wildlife? I, I don't know of any, but I suspect it's, it, there are. Um, there was, a, we can imagine that there's a similar uh, shut down near airports uh, would be the best example, perhaps, and other industrial sites, but airports would be one. Um, air transportation was reduced dramatically and has been, and maybe only just recovering a little bit now. Uh, airports are noisy places, one might imagine for birds in particular. Um, people living near airports would have noticed this, so the environment would have had a much quieter environment. So in addition to the pollution, the particulate pollution from planes, there would have been less, uh, less noise. So uh, another study that was just coming out was the fact that uh, 
trucks on highways and roads generate seismic energy. And in fact, seismic and, and hydrophones listening to sounds in the earth were already recording less traffic noise on roads associated with economic turndown. So yes, there are a number of studies that are measuring uh, reductions of terrestrial noise. Perfect. Does COVID-19 present a different opportunity to reduce vessel noise than the decrease in the vessel traffic due to the 2008, 2008 financial crisis? I think it's similar um, in the sense that it, the, 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 tr the reduction of shipping um, isn't directly related to COVID other than it's directly related to the industrial and economic activity, both in the shipping of materials and the receiving of materials. So, um, and the economic shutdown was similar in some sense. If we, if we ship less goods, then there's less traffic on the water. There's no obviously direct connection between COVID-19 reducing ships. It's only the economic uh, uh, link. Um, and unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever you, wherever you want to look at it, um, there is a, there's a tendency or an expectation that we return to normal. And we hear that, when will we return to normal? And when will the economics return to normal? And perhaps we should be rethinking is, let's reset what normal means. Maybe we don't need to travel so much. Maybe we should be buying more local. Maybe we don't need to ship food and, and resources around the globe quite as much. We should really take this opportunity to change our habits of uh, less transportation, less uh, uh, buying of foreign goods and shipping of foreign material and buy local and reduce our footprint. Um, so that would be the lesson. And I think what we can contribute to is show uh, quantifiably how the reduction of eco economics and transportation has impacted the environment in a positive way and then change our habits. Um, that's really what's going to have to happen. Thank you for that excellent question. Thank you for that excellent answer, Richard. Has anyone looked at changing well behavior during the ship noise reduction? Example, were there sighted more often in the previously noisy areas? Uh, an, an excellent question. And um, one of the interesting aspects, we, we rely actually for a lot of our information about what's happening with uh, the local whales in particular on whale watching industry. That, and that's a tourist based industry. And for several months, the whale watching industry was, was not uh, heading out. And so we didn't have a lot of eyes on the water. There were some research groups, um, uh, the, the Beam Reach Group and the Orca Lab and the Vancouver Aquarium that were heading out. Um, the Southern residents didn't return to the Salish Sea from their offshore habitats until early July. Late June, I think, was the first um, observation of the southern residents coming back to the Salish Sea. So perhaps they missed the quietest period, but that's the quietest period in the Salish Sea. It would have been quiet wherever they were. So even though the res southern resident whales were off in their winter foraging grounds, perhaps most likely off the west coast of North America, where they're all the way from the Columbia up to Vancouver Island, Wherever they were, it was very likely quieter and they would have been able to hunt more effectively and communicate more effectively. So what we're looking for now is, can we distinguish that they're healthier? And one study uh, set of research that I'm aware of, they're using drones, the Vancouver Aquarium and various Orca labs are using drones to fly over the whales and take aerial pictures and measure the health through their body size of the whales. And the early indications are that the Southern residents, when they returned this early July, were looking healthier than they have in past years. So even when they did show up late, they were already looking healthier because they were very likely, wherever they were, it was quieter. And so, um, but, but uh, th this question, it's, it's, I hope I've answered that question a little bit. It's a complicated uh, answer to go out. Uh, when we go out and we're doing the, we're, we're generating the noise. So it's unfortunately, whale watching is a, is a source for noise, not a, 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 a valuable source for information and sightings, but also a source for noise. 
Sorry Thank about you. that answer. I think it was a good answer. When assessing noise levels in the ocean, do you remove other sources of noise, such as weather-related sources, to determine how much noise is associated with shipping versus natural causes? Uh, excellent question. And the, and the short answer is no. It's quite difficult to, at a particular frequency, for example, 100 hertz, filter out different sources that would be generating sound at 100 hertz. Um, that would almost be, uh, I won't say impossible, but very difficult to do. We can filter out at a frequency band, but not filter out the different sources at that same frequency band. So one of the ideas is to, that's why the analysis was particularly looking at 100 Hertz is because that is a known band where the shipping noise peaks. Um, wind and other sounds are at, at other frequencies, but within a frequency band, it's almost impossible to remove the multiple sources that contribute to that frequency band. So that is included and all those noise, all those sources are within that band. Thank you, Richard. Excellent question. That was really good. So how to distinguish between lack of Chinook salmon numbers and hunting success from increased noise? Can you That's answer that? That's a good question. And now I, this is out, certainly outside of my area of expertise or even no, I don't really have much expertise in these whale research, but certainly even out of my range of, of knowledge, this is really getting into the fine subjective assessment of how do we interpret the success of hunting southern resident killer whales on salmon? Um, and generally, we have some thoughts that are, if there are a lot of salmon, um, they might be successful even in a noisy environment. But as the number of salmon decrease, it's very likely a noisy environment is, becomes a compounded stressor and makes it more and more difficult if the salmon aren't in high numbers. So we think the combination of low numbers and a noisy environment is a terrible combination. If there were low numbers, but it was very, very quiet, the whales could be successful in finding those salmon through echolocation at great distance and still be successful in feeding. But when you introduce noise, it limits their ability. And if there are low numbers of salmon, it could be a killer or it could just be a, a showstopper for them. Uh, but that's an excellent set of questions and we start to interpret subjective uh, answers in there, but that is part of the research that's ongoing. Yes, if anyone Again, has any question. thoughts on that, please comment on the Zoom chat. Does the map show all hydrophones in the Salish Sea or only the ONC real-time hydrophones? The maps I showed only showed the Ocean Networks Canada hydrophones. Um, and it didn't even show all the live ones. It showed historically where we've had hydrophones. For example, we had a hydrophone in Saanich Inlet for a number of years, but I do not think there's a hydrophone there now or it's been periodic. Um, that is something we're working with the, with the uh, hydrophone network to generate. We're actually working with Orca Lab who ha had generated a Google map image of um, a few years ago, trying to have a map that would show all of the hydrophone, the live hydrophones in the Salish Sea. Um, this requires us to have good collaboration between all of the hydrophone uh, providers. Um, not all hydrophone data is accessible to the public. Ocean Networks Canada uh, prides itself on making all of the data publicly available, but that's not always the case. Some hydrophone data is collected by the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and is only available in a delayed mode. Uh, so we have, um, even though there's a lot of hydrophones deployed, and I think um, the number of hydrophones from all sources would actually be pretty uh, amazing. I think we would have as many as 20 hydrophones throughout the Salish Sea across all of the different operators. Um, and, and not all of that data is available, but we're working on having a collaborative map, but that requires all the participants to, to allow us to put that, that information on. That's a good question too. Thank These you are for excellent the questions. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, any plans to put an observatory on the East Coast? What can you um, tell us? I think there are, there are plans. We've got various installations on the East Coast. I think Hollywood uh, will have a, a, a small installation and we're also supporting some East Coast initiatives. But at the moment, um, I don't think there's a, a, a large initiative to put a cabled observatory. 
um, on the East Coast. There are a number of institutions, uh, University of Laval, Ramuski, Dalhousie, and St. John's that put out periodic moorings and have hydrophone networks that are not live, but are um, recorded internally. Um, but I, at the moment, I don't think there are many opportunities that Ocean Networks Canada is, is linked to. Um, but there are some uh, hydrophones and I think even live hydrophones on the East Coast. The whale species of interest on the East Coast is the right whale. And in particular, the Gulf of St. Lawrence is a critical, identified as a critical habitat zone. And they actually have interesting measures there when they hear or uh, detect a whale visually from whale watching boats that they uh, limit boat traffic in those regions. So the right whale on the East Coast is of, of the concern there. Good question. Plans for the future, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, is the ship and convoy approach being used anywhere to this noise? noise? I, I, that's a good question. I don't know. This was one of the ideas that was put forward, that perhaps uh, we would uh, put the ships through these shipping lanes in convoys. I, I do know that they ran into some operational issues. The, the shipping companies, um, were, we can imagine a very large ship that costs millions of dollars and has maybe tens or hundreds of millions of dollars worth of cargo on board. Every hour is worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so if you were to tell these ships that they have to, you have to wait, now you have to wait three hours to go with the four o'clock convoy, that would translate into hundreds or tens of thousands of dollars of lost uh, business. And so we haven't really been able to figure out how to do convoys, I think, very well. And there's limited evidence that it's, it's an idea, but I don't think it's actually been implemented because it's economically very challenging. Yes, very interesting. These, yeah, these are and all excellent questions. Yeah, fantastic. For the last question, can a similar cabled, cable with hydrophones and other sensors help the North Atlantic right whales? I, I, would, I would venture to say yes. Uh, the Gulf of St. Lawrence in particular is known as a uh, critical habitat. Um, they do have gliders and other hydrophone moorings out there trying to identify uh, when and where the whales are, but a cabled installation there would probably be uh, a very, very fruitful endeavor. Very good question. Thanks, Louisa, and thanks everyone for participating. Yes. So uh, thank you to all the participants. Thank you, Richard, and also thank you, Dwight, for helping us with the interactivity and uh, the chat. Goodbye to our friends, and we'll hope to see you in the fall. Yes, very soon.